Natural Therapies down there at Edith Street, Wenham. You've been a busy girl. You went out last night. Oh, I went to see the Bodyguard musical. At QPAC. Yeah, really yeah. fantastic. You really enjoyed it. I oh, it great show. I was tossing up whether I should go or not. But, uh, well, if you like the movie, you'll love the musical. It's... And, of course, the lovely tragic case, Whitney Houston, was in that. Um, yeah. And your boyfriend. Kevin Costner. Does Mr. Guy know about that? Oh, he's a little aware. He's a little aware, is he? A little. Mr. Guy, I'll have a chat to you later. Um, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I thought since we started talking about colds, bugs, flus last week, I thought I'd... I'm suffering, by the way. <laughs> you chat about it and in about it comes. three days ago it hit me and uh, suffering today. Yeah, and I just thought I'd mention a couple of my favourite things for getting people back on top of things. You know, it was funny, one of my clients was saying this morning that she had a hot stone massage with Renergy. You would think a hot stone massage, feeling lovely and relaxed. But of course, what does heat do? Heat... Incubates. It, it, um, if you've got any viruses living in the biofilm or mucoid plaque in your body, it can activate them. You know, they can be just lying sleepily away. Now, we were talking about this last week, a swim in the ocean. Yes. Yeah. You yeah know, it revitalises you. It so does. It's the opposite effect to uh, being too warm in bed. Well, in, uh, in a lot of European countries, they actually use heat to activate the immune system. So that's why they use things like infrared saunas and stuff like that. So heat is a good thing, but if you've got something lying dormant, it, it, can, it, it really can. So she was telling me that uh, she went home afterwards. She actually got out to the waiting room and she had a fabulous treatment. She said, oh, I was so relaxed. <laughs> but she got outside and she was like, hmm... I feel a little woozy. And she was thinking, I might go get a coffee before I head home. And then she, she couldn't make it to the coffee shop. She sat in a car and she thought, oh, what should I do? So she drove on home and she ended up going to the doctor in the next day or two and they checked out her ears and had these uh, infections in both ears. But she's got a high pain tolerance, so she wasn't even aware. So anyway, this morning when I was doing a reboot on her immune system with kinesiology, the poor, the poor darling, she's always had middle ear infections. So you know how we've said... Swimmers before, get a lot of that. Yes, she could never put a head underwater as a kid, ever. You know, it just wasn't possible. I know, I know. So a lot of people end up with these infections just living in the middle ear, you know, for their whole life, you know, but then they, they come and go. No, they don't go. They hide. They hide in the inner like, ear like canal. A, a dormant volcano ready to come to life. They do, for, yeah. when you're, for when the next thing happens, for when you're next stressed or for when you're next toxic or for when... Yeah, so it's sort of interesting. We reboot. So how is she now? Oh, she's fabulous. On the road to yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And I was going to say we're talking about the beach. Oh yes, um, I read in the paper today that, um, or was it yesterday? Antibiotics that the doctors say take the full course, no exceptions. You finish the full course. That's being turned on its head. Yeah, they know that antibiotics are being overprescribed. It is a really common problem. And so many people know that they're going to the doctors for viral things and they know antibiotics don't work, but they take them anyway. So because if you've got fevers and that sort of thing, that's generally viral as opposed to bacterial. So taking an antibiotic, it's almost like we're being given it for the secondary infection we think is going to come along. And in which this, probably doesn't. Which, well, it's sort of interesting because taking something that... Because antibiotics don't boost the immune system, they suppress the immune system. They're giving the immune system something that isn't there, so therefore the immune system takes a, takes a break. It sort of well, has a little I holiday. Bit, uh, and I dare say a lot of our listeners probably like me, sad to say, but uh, when I take an antibiotic, after a few days, I feel a bit... Ugh. Yeah, it... Because it messes up the good guys in your gut. So, you know, we're 90% bugs, people. We're just 90% yeah, bugs. So it's just true. It's true. <laughs> and the more research, that I'm sure it'll end up being we're like 1% human. But anyway, at the moment, we're 10% human. This is a good thing. So when we take antibiotics, it, it can really mess with that combination of your mutt the your balance. gut microbiota, yeah. So sometimes we can be killing off some of the good guys as well. Well, you will. You can't take antibiotics without destroying some of the good and some of the bad. So in the old days, like even going back to, say, two, three years ago, they used to say don't take probiotics, so things like inner health ultraflora, that sort of thing, with your antibiotics because they counterbalance each other. That's not true. All of the research is now saying it, as soon as you're on antibiotics, you need to be taking probiotics because you're destroying the good guys. And the more out of balance they get, 
the harder it is to get them back in balance. Yeah. 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 And it's all a space. It's all a space game in the gut. So if you um, if you can imagine antibiotics might destroy, and let, just for argument's sake, let's say 20%. Let's say 20% of the gut bugs, they destroy. That means there's space in the gut. Now, if you have also a low-lying, say, fungal or candida infection or something like that, if there's space... That's why they can thrive. That's why so many people get thrush and itchiness and side effects like that after antibiotics because the bug is just lying dormant and, and then they're given space. Rampant. It does. Yeah, you're given the space to, you know, it's going for it. Good, so, yeah. So the probiotic thing, uh, all of the researchers, the... All of the researchers talking in the natural therapies world are saying that really, no, we need to be taking those probiotics at the same time as the antibiotics. And you can also be taking things to be boosting your own natural immunity in the background, like vitamin C, echinacea, andrographis, olive leaf, oil. Olive uh, leaf, olive extract. leaf extract. Yeah, yeah, all of those things in the background at the same time. They well, you, don't... You know what else I've uh, read about? I've started taking, in fact, um, apple cider with the mother in it in brackets yeah underneath. now what does that mean well apple cider well it means it's going to be the best quality of it it's like the uh olive you've got olive. to give the bottle a good shake to get yeah. the murky bit down the bottom uh, yes. distributed evenly through the, yeah. the liquid but uh, it's not a nice taste but so it. part of the reason for apple cider vinegar being such a powerful tool for a lot of people is that it uh because generally people take it in the morning in a little yes. bit of yes. warm water or you're doing it in cold i just take it straight from an egg cup. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. Then I have this funny convulsive shiver going I'm sure you do. So it's actually better a little bit diluted, only because it's vinegar. So if you've got any ulcerations in the gut and you take that, so you obviously Mm -hmm. don't, it would hurt. So it's sort of like, um, especially if someone has gut issues, if you take it undiluted, it can cause pain. So therefore, I would would start with certainly taking it diluted. And this is where people like... um, you know, you hear about these famous models who do drink their two litres of water in the morning along with their apple cider vinegar and it keeps them skinny. I'm sure not eating helps that as well. But, you know, it's sort of one of those things where uh, the apple cider vinegar, even though it's acid, like it sounds like an, it's an acidic thing, what it's doing is stimulating the hydrochloric acid in your gut. And the hydrochloric acid is a good acid. So it's the whole, it is. So it's the whole thing between good acid and bad acid. It's when foods ferment in your stomach that it causes the bad acid. That's when we need the reflux, you know, sort of medication. So it won't do any harm? No, definitely not. No, Great thing. Hey, you speak about water. Now, where I used to work for quite a few years, I was always stunned by the number of girls who would come to work with their big bottle of water and they would sip every 15 minutes. Now, 20 years ago, yes. it was not seen. But it seems to become a, a, is it a fashionable habit? Drinking the water. To sip it constantly. Well, it is funny because they do. I I can't do it because my brain doesn't work like that. If I remember to drink water, I just scull a cup or two, you know, at a time. But that's that's me. Uh, And I don't have time in my world to have, you know, half a cup of water every 15 minutes. But apparently that's approximately the amount of water that our body can metabolise at a time. So if too much goes into the stomach, uh, you know, a lot of it won't be absorbed. But nonetheless, you have to do it regularly to get your body used to the idea of uh, absorbing water. So so it's sort of like there's a two-part process. If you've gone from being unhealthy and drinking heaps of, um, say, soft drinks and coffees and things like that, and then someone says, you've got to drink two litres of water a day, and all of a sudden you start drinking water, your body's not going to know what to do with it. It takes time to retrain your cells of your body, and often it's like two or three months in order for your body to absorb more and more and more. It really does. It it takes time. Minimum three cups of coffee a day. Not cups, um, mugs. Yeah, and I'm sure everyone knows the general rule of thumb. Because uh, tea and coffee are dehydrating, so they are diuretics. Yeah. So therefore they make us pee. So because they're diuretics, they actually, there's a net effect of being dehydrating on the body. So therefore, when you have a cup of coffee, you should, you know, scull a couple of glasses of water yeah. afterwards just Follow to keep up. yourself balanced. And once again, it's a sort of, but you know, that only happens in some people. Do you know what blood group you are by any chance? Wouldn't have yeah. a clue. See, I a, should know. See, A blood groups have quite low um, acid levels, bad, uh, good acid levels. So A blood groups have the lowest hydrochloric acid levels in the stomach of any blood group. So, so therefore, the... coffee is actually beneficial for A blood group people. Now, 
O well, blood groups. My record. We should go and check my records at your place. Well, <laughs> your business. Yeah, so it's well, well check it out. Uh, so we, whereas O blood groups have got lots of, they have the propensity for building up lots of bad acid really quickly. So coffee is actually well, what's in the. What's the sign of excessive acid in your body? Well, it can be anything like exhaustion or itchy skin or uh, it, uh, fingernails. Not cracking. not sleeping well. Body. Um, that's more calcium fluoride and that sort of thing. And uh, the ridges on the skin are more silica deficiency. So you know they're more minerals tend to be more related to the fingernails. Hmm. Uh, so I'd be thinking more things like um, general bloating, burping, belching, wind, yeah. flatulence, diarrhea, constipation. Any of that can go upstream from the stomach. And stress can shut down the gut, and stress you know, is a terrible thing, it's isn't it? it's That's just up there. Responsible for a lot of ills. It really is. Now the act is coming. Yes. I uh, read in the paper again. I do a lot of reading. In fact, um, statins. That's right. Oh yes. Statins. Now there's a lot of um, word going around that statins are bad. Get off them. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh, of course, the medical fraternities say, no, don't get off them. But apparently a lot of people um, are following the gossip out there who are on statins yeah. and not getting professional help from yourself or people like you yeah. in regards to getting something to replace them. Now, if someone goes off statins, yes. what can they safely go on to curb the build-up of cholesterol? Because I think that's the main reason you take statins, isn't it? Yes, although some people just have a heart attack, so therefore they're put on statins for the rest of their life anyway, regardless of cholesterol levels. And quite often cholesterol levels get lower and lower and lower and lower and people are get kept on low. the statin drugs as well. Because don't forget naturopathically, we look at cholesterol very, very differently from the medical mainstream. One of the, there was a cardiovascular surgeon slash researcher a few years ago who spoke to us at Congress and he's, he's written like a dozen books on why statins are not great for us. And he, because he's looked at uh, a lot of the research over the last 30, 40 years in America with people who have been on statins. So because they've got so many people, they've got a lot of data. So therefore, when they've uh, looked at people on, say, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, cholesterol drugs, blood thinners, that sort of thing, and looked at the combinations and then looked at how people's life expectancy ended up being. So with cholesterol, uh, it depends what's causing the cholesterol to rise. So generally it's not diet, although, you know, medically that would be argued. Could so you say that word again, stress? Stress, absolutely. Because we need cholesterol to make stress hormones, we need cholesterol to make estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, we need cholesterol to make just about, you know, we need well, it for lots of things in the body. There is, absolutely. And so what we need, you can have high cholesterol. I think I even said this uh, a week or two ago. I, I checked my cholesterol recently and my total cholesterol was quite high. Because there's been a lot of sleepless nights lately. We've had a bit of stuff going on. But anyway, so I've so therefore, because I'm not sleeping well, I have to run on adrenaline through the day. So when you run on adrenaline through the day, you're going to automatically have more adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol. All of those are damaging to the nervous system. Cholesterol is released to protect your nervous system. Uh -huh. So therefore, you need to sort of think, okay, what's going on in this person's body that their cholesterol is too high? If it's something like um, the nervous system is being damage, then maybe fish oils is a nice, nice, easy one to get in there. If they are taking it um, to prevent a heart, a heart attack or a stroke or something, then we would look at natural things to bring down the blood pressure and the cholesterol, things like cardio X and coenzyme Q10 and that sort of thing. If they're doing it to prevent uh, the blood you know, from getting too thick because they know they've got strokes in the family and that sort of thing, we would look at blood thinners like ginkgo and brahmi and there are herbs that are really, oh, vitamin C and vitamin E. See, my dear old mum, she had, um, bless her, she had four heart attacks. Yes. I think the first when she was 32 thereabouts, very, very young. Yeah. Because uh, she had rheumatic fever as a kid, uh, which weakens the heart. But she had four, but never went on statins. She took fish oil tablets, yes, religiously. Yeah. And um, she lived to 92. Yeah. It, well, what he found with his research was that taking the drugs didn't necessarily reduce the number of cardiac events. So, which was interesting because they were expecting when they looked at the data... A reduction. A reduction. So I think once we've damaged the heart by having a heart attack or something like that, the heart's already damaged. The drugs simply stop 
the laying down of cholesterol and they keep the blood thin. So therefore, if there's clots in the blood, you know, which we would see looking at the blood. So sometimes these things are still in the blood, even though the numbers on the page are really good, you know, with your, so it can be worth having a look anyway. So, um, you know, it really depends on the reason. Anyone on statin drugs really needs to be on coenzyme Q10. Like that, that is an absolute, like that's been proven for 30 years. Coenzyme Q10 is the most important antioxidant for the heart. And statin drugs stop the production of coenzyme Q10. So it's one of those little ironies where the drug that's supposed to be protecting the heart is actually stopping the major antioxidant. So an antioxidant is something that helps to stop up free radical damage and tissue damage. You, you now, statins, of course, you can't sell, but uh, this, what is it, QN? Coenzyme Q10, absolutely. Coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10, yeah. You sell those. Yeah, and then there's an absorption thing, of course. So there's lots of different qualities it, out there. Again, it's a balancing act. It is a balancing act, balance. absolutely. And sometimes the blood pressure or blood thinning uh, needs to be done through minerals. So if we're really mineral deficient, sometimes you simply can't maintain a healthy bloodstream. So sometimes it can really be magnesium or calcium or potassium or B vitamins or something like that that we need to get in there. So that's sort of why we get people to fill out a lot of forms when they come into the clinic it gives us a snapshot okay, it really does and but there again you rely on someone being honest too we can sort of tell if people are being honest or not well you could tell i was honest couldn't you? yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll be back we're with madonna guy from new leaf natural therapies their phone number is 